question is that the House do now adjourn. Elliot Colburn. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, may I wish you and all colleagues a very happy Easter as we approach the Easter recess. Uh, today, I would like to address the adequacy of public transport in my Carshalton and Wallington constituency, which is one of the worst connected boroughs in terms of public transport connectivity in Greater London. And being able to move around quickly and conveniently, as well as easily commute to jobs and businesses around London, is vital for a vibrant economy, community, and my constituents living on the edges of London and Surrey deserve the same levels of connectivity that the rest of the capital enjoys. And I'd like to touch on a variety of areas of public transport, from trains to buses, the overground, and of course, our roads. And there are areas where transport provision could much be strengthened, and I will no doubt touch on some of those a little later in my speech. But my constituents of Carshalton and Wallington have been deprived of consistent and reliable public transport by the Mayor of London, backed up by a Lib Dem Council. Rather than help improve our connectivity, the Mayor and the Council have overseen a shelving of the tram extension, the scrapping of the Go Sutton bus entirely, the possibility of reducing bus services like the 410, scrapping the 455 and replacing it with an in inconvenient existing route, all this whilst just bringing in a, the so-called Superloop, which is just a rebranding of an existing bus route. Now, myself and my honourable friend, the member for Sutton and Cheam, were keen to begin discussions on an extension to the London Overground from West Croydon to Sutton before the pandemic. But the sheer mismanagement of TfL's finances by the Mayor means that this is now very unlikely. The Mayor, to almost no one's surprise, is asleep at the wheel and otherwise occupied with his own vanity projects and too busy imposing ULEZ on my constituents and seems content to leave my constituency stranded without a public transport system which it can be proud of. Now, since the pandemic, the rail services to Carshalton, Wallington, Hackbridge and Carshalton Beaches stations have been running at a reduced level. Regular, consistent services are vital to connect my constituents with their employment, education and essential services in other parts of London, but of course Surrey as well. This reduced service means less trains down to, um, uh, um, from Carshalton to London, Victoria. Um, something like half of the existing services um, are running, which has meant a significant reduction in accessibility and convenience. Now, off-peak services from Carshalton Beaches and Wallington to West Croydon and beyond uh, have been reduced from six to four trains an hour. Now, fortunately, Thameslink services to Blackfriars have remained unchanged, which offers some semblance of stability, but the overall picture paints, uh, paints a concerning narrative of dwindling connectivity and accessibility for my constituents. Now, I have long campaigned for and been successful in, con in convincing rail operators to restore some of the peak time services post-COVID, as well as extending the number of carriages on some peak, uh, peak rail services. But these are still too far, uh, too far away from what they used to be, and my mailbag is often filled up with constituents who are unable to board extremely busy weekend services that are often made up of just four or five carriages. So I would support any support that the Minister can help to provide to convince rail operators to restore more peak time rail services, adequate uh, numbers of carriages on trains and adequate weekend services as well. But staying on the topic of rail, I would like to thank Network Rail and indeed GTR, who operate Southern and Link, uh, Thameslink, for their continued engagement with myself uh, on a number of different areas. And one of them is the southbound platform at Hackbridge Station, uh, which has secured funding, which we have now secured funding for, to fix what I call the Hackbridge Gap problem. Now, this gap is a huge step down from the train to the platform, extremely dangerous. Um, which many people have fallen down, and it has been something which has become so serious that some people have had to travel on to the next stop, Hack Carshalton, and come back to Hackbridge via the northbound line because they simply don't feel safe disembarking, uh, disembarking from Hackbridge Station. I am very glad that we have secured the funding to do that, and I look forward to seeing that project get underway. Now, I've also been campaigning hard for step-free access to the southbound platform at Carshalton Beaches Station. 
Um, now, we've put in several access for all applications over the years, and I do hope that the Minister might be able to give some indication as to when the next round might be available uh, for comment. Uh, I sincerely hope that we will be successful this time around so that, once again, people don't have to travel on to the next station, which is Sutton, and come back to Carshalton Beaches the other way in order to disembark safely. But moving slightly outside of my uh, constituency, if I may, um, another area that would greatly improve transport for my constituents, and indeed this is probably the major sticking point when it comes to increasing rail capacity for my constituency, but frankly most of suburban London, and that is the Croydon Area Remodelling Scheme, which is the major junction on the Brighton Main Line and the suburban rail network in South London and the Home Counties. Now, this project does a number of things. It upgrades East Croydon Station and the surrounding rail infrastructure to enhance capacity and efficiency and encompasses several pivotal elements, including the revitalisation and the renovation of the station itself, the remodelling of Selhurst Junction, which is where the trains are becoming congested, and expanding the railway tracks north, east, uh, north of East Croydon. Now, these capacity issues that this project would resolve are often the sticking point for running more rail services in the region. Indeed, GTR and Network Rail have spoken com uh, quite regularly about their ambitions to make suburban rail services a lot more like a metro system that we have on the London Underground, a sort of turn up and go system, rather than the strict timetable and the limited timetable that we have at the moment. Now, by delivering on the Croydon Area Remodelling Scheme, or the Croydon Bottleneck, um, we would help alleviate this congestion, which wouldn't just be good for my constituents, but actually for the majority of London and the South East. This would really unlock rail capacity, going all the way down to Brighton and parts of the South Coast and the capital as well. So, in the words of the Minister for Rail and HS2, I quote that in the, in the economic context, it is more important than ever that the enhancement schemes that we take forward are affordable and respond to the changes in demand for travel. And that's exactly what the Croydon Area Remodelling Scheme would deliver. Now, moreover, as we await updates to the rail network enhancements pipeline, it is essential to acknowledge the broader context with which the Croydon Area Remodelling Scheme operates. The government's commitment to rail enhancements, shown through net, the network north, announcement, uh, network north announcements, reflects an effort to modernise and expand railway infrastructure across the country, and it should be commended for that. And the Croydon Area Remodelling Scheme would bring a more efficient, sustainable and interconnected transport network to the London and the South East, and would show clear improvements, not least of which in the increase in rail capacity to my constituents in Carshalton and Wallington. But finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about connectivity by road, which is still the most common form of transport used in my constituency. And the one thing that is attacking my, my constituents at the moment the most, and which is causing them the most grief, is of course the dreaded expansion of ULES. And I'd like to uh, commend my honourable friend, the member for Dartford, uh, who attempted to bring in a bill to overturn ULES, which I'm glad that the government lent its backing to, um, which is incredibly welcome. And it's very, very disappointing that Labour and the Liberal Democrats both tried to prevent this bill from being spoken. In fact, Labour members of this House talked out the bill to prevent its passage through this House. And as the Secretary of State rightly said, ULES is a cruel form of taxation, affecting the poorest in society, hitting heavily those people who have older motor vehicles that they simply cannot afford to upgrade with or without a scrappage scheme. And my constituents are regularly raising their concerns about ULES with me, and I completely agree with them. And as I have stressed, the Mayor fails to acknowledge the poor connectivity that Carshall and Wellington has. On top of that, he has decided to tax the most hard-working, poorest Londoners. And it's about time that the air pollution argument that often gets made when it comes to ULES is eradicated, because a genuine concern for the environment would involve a complete ban of non-compliant vehicles, not a charge to use them. Instead, prov instead provided Khan finds himself um, with an additional £12.50 per car in the TfL coffers, you can drive as you please. The evidence has been clear from the Mayor's own impact assessment and from assessments that have been done since that this is not about air quality, this is about the Mayor's inability to manage TfL's finances. The expansion scheme was roundly rejected by the people of London, as can be evidenced through his consultation, and yet the Mayor, backed by the Lib Dems and the Greens in City Hall, all gleefully voted in favour of it. In fact, the Lib Dems boasted that it was their idea in the first place. 
the mayor went ahead with this tax on motorists and he didn't even mention it in his manifesto to get elected. So I would be cautious to those voters who are now being told by the mayor that he won't bring in any more charges if he gets re-elected. Do not believe it. We know that the mayor of London is currently looking, he has employed people in TfL to look at a pay per mile scheme, which means every single car driver in the Greater London will be charged not only for using their car, no matter if it's compliant or not, but for how long and how far you drive it for. We must reject that. We must get rid of the Mayor of London on the 2nd of May and replace him with someone who will not charge car drivers, and that is Susan Hall. Now, between September the 26th and those, uh, November the 6th, in the early stages of the expanded ULES, there were something like 2,700 fines issued in Sutton, and nearly, uh, nearly 100,000 in London as a whole, once again proving that ULES is simply a money-making scheme. And I've heard from many of my constituents that they have not been accepted for the scrappage scheme, and that's uh, only about a third of all applications in my borough have been accepted so far, and yet they simply cannot afford to upgrade their vehicle. And this place is a huge burden and a threat on people, people's livelihoods. This means that people who are elderly are being isolated in their own homes because they cannot afford to um, get in the car and leave it. This means people are not coming to visit them. This includes small businesses that are either having to pass a £12.50 a day charge onto, onto their consumers or absorb it in a time where they are struggling as well. It means that the Royal Marsden Cancer Hospital is having to refund cancer patients £12.50 a day to come to Sutton to receive treatment for cancer. The NHS should not be having to reimburse ULES charges to cancer patients. There should not be ULES charges on cancer patients, and yet that is the reality that we're living in in Sutton. Nurses, doctors, teachers, parents, charities, businesses, all of them are being affected by this, and hard-working Londoners deserve better. So to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to ask the Minister if he will continue to work with me to see what we can do to improve public transport connectivity at a time where the Mayor simply clearly is not interested in doing so, and the Lib Dems gave up on my area a long time ago. And I would very much like to welcome the Minister. He's been a great friend to Carl Shorten and Wallington. He's visited before in other roles in government, so I'd be delighted to welcome him back um, to see the opportunities that Carl Shorten and Wallington has when it comes to transport. And can the Minister reiterate from the dispatch box that the Mayor's unwanted ULES charge on Londoners does not help my constituents? They should have, uh, Labour should have backed my honourable friend, the Member for Dartford's bill last week. It places a burden on people at a time where they can least afford it. And instead, we should be looking to increase the public transport connectivity of London rather than attacking those who can't change to an alternative. The ever present Minister Guy Offerman. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, it, it is a sense of déjà vu all over again for you and I, is it not? Because at Christmas, uh, the last debate before Christmas, when the House rose, featured somebody I know as the uh, Deputy Speaker, that would be yourself, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, my honourable friend who sits behind me, who is the Transport Parliamentary Private Secretary, honourably fighting the fight on behalf of the DFT, and my good self making the case at the dispatch box on an adjournment debate, and it is a privilege and an honour to be the last uh, minister to speak at the dispatch box before Easter, and I echo and reiterate uh, my good friend, uh, the Honourable Member, who made the first point at the outset, which is we need to wish everybody in the House, and who works so hard to keep us safe in this particular place, uh, that we cherish and love and adore. Uh, a very happy Easter and a gentle rest over the Easter yeah. holiday so that we all emerge recharged and uh, rebooted and ready to keep the flame of democracy alive on an ongoing basis because this really matters and uh, having the opportunity to address the House, make the case for democracy, make the case uh, for individual constituents and bringing their concerns and their uh, hopes, their fears, their aspirations to this place is something that we should all cherish and adore. So, it is a great honour and a privilege to respond to my honourable friend. I have visited his constituency in the past. I will be delighted to visit it again, and I look forward to doing that in the next few weeks. Um, it is absolutely the case, 
to answer his three points at the outset before I get into the nuts and bolts of this, that I will be delighted to work with him on the causes he has set out today, delighted to visit soon, and delighted to make the case that ULEZ is a blunt instrument, and we will discuss that in a bit more detail. I can assure the House we're not going to spend the next two hours and 17, seven minutes discussing it, but ULEZ is a blunt instrument which needs to be taken into the context of the individual circumstances of the Londoners and the outer Londoners who it affects. It needs to take into account uh, the impact it has on low income and public sector workers because uh, the stats on that are genuinely horrifying and it is not something, with great respect, that has been dealt with uh, in any way sensitively. It is not something that has been dealt with as part of a manifesto uh, from the previous mayor. And I was the minister who responded on behalf of government last Friday to the bill, and I want to touch upon that in a bit of detail. Can, can, I, can I first of all uh, discuss with him, however, he raised a number of particular issues which I want to try and address. The first is uh, the issue of the, um, the mayor and the finances of the mayor, because of course he will be aware, and the Secretary of State has put this on record in writing, that uh, the mayor had to be bailed out by a uh, multi-billion pound settlement uh, due to his uh, mismanagement of his funds. Clearly, that has impacted on the provision of bus services, which are utterly key. And I, as the bus minister, am passionate about buses, passionate about the growth in buses, which is actually happening uh, post-COVID. But I am alarmed and concerned to hear about the litany of bus services that have been lost in my honourable friend's constituency by the actions of the mayor. And I regret to advise I have no power whatsoever to intervene in the mayoral zone uh, to address uh, any of the bus losses or to try and nudge individual operators to make changes. Uh, we'll come on to rail in a second because some power does exist there and as he's, he, I know he has worked with the rail minister in copious detail to try and address that. But that is the reality of the mayoral situation on buses that um, is of great concern. And I met, for example, only yesterday with my honourable friend for South End, and she and I had an uh, hour-long discussion with the bus operators to try and thrash out difficulties, try and find a way, allow the BSIP and BSOG funding to try and be addressed in those particular ways. And, and that just does not exist, unless, of course, the Mayor is providing the right sort of assistance and is prioritising uh, constituents that my honour friend, friend represents. So on the issue of buses, I regret I am uh, powerless to intervene, but obviously his constituents have the ultimate power to intervene, and I would urge them to do so for reasons that he set out and for which I utterly endorse, and I would obviously put my backing behind Susan Hall. In relation to the overall principle of rail, so I, I know that he has worked with my honourable friend, the rail minister, over a period of time to try and improve and enhance the rail service that his constituents sometimes have enjoyed, sometimes have not enjoyed, as we all know. And someone who commutes in from South London when I am here in uh, Westminster, I share some of their pain and have experienced some of that pain. Uh, and I accept that uh, the, there are difficulties on an ongoing basis, but some of which have been addressed, and he rightly identified the companies that have assisted him and really played ball with the, with the circumstances. Um, we are at about 85% of pre-COVID numbers, and I, I can assure him and give an undertaking that the Rail Minister is happy to meet with him and also with operators and with particular cohorts of constituents and councillors uh, to discuss potential improvements and how it is further work can be done on an ongoing basis. He, he raised the important issue of the Croydon Area Remodelling Scheme, and I would endorse his views that it is clearly a, a massive improvement and enhancement that we should get behind, and that very much this is the case, that uh, such an investment will be a massive improvement for uh, the wider benefits of his constituents. In, in terms of the um, other particular rail and, and uh, infrastructure projects. He talked about 
uh, Govia Thameslink Railway, the GTR, and clearly uh, he has worked very, very closely with them um, in respect of the services that they are providing, um, and the particularly, I know, the busy weekend services between Carshalton and London Victoria are utterly vital, and he, he rightly makes the point that from June 2024, the timetable change, um, the services will now run with eight to ten carriages, I'm told, where previously some ran with only five, and I'm sure he'll welcome the additional capacity for passenger using these services, and we certainly require all train operators to continually review the services they provide so that their timetables can reflect changing passenger demand and carefully balance both the cost, capacity and performance. He raised, as I think he has done on a repeat basis, to be fair to him, the issue of access for all. And I, I champion what point that he is making. He would love me at this dispatch box to triumphantly pull out the Oscar-winning envelope and confirm uh, the uh, campaign that he has fought so assiduously for so long. I regret I cannot do that today. But in the time-honoured tradition, I can confirm that the decision in respect of uh, the next announcement on extending the access for all and improving the rail accessibility will be made very, very shortly. And uh, he has made his case on a repeat basis and if he hasn't uh, re-met uh, the Rail Minister who oversees that on that particular issue, I am going to personally go and communicate that to the Rail Minister myself so that they fully understand how much that particularly matters uh, to his constituents and how brilliantly he has made the case uh, on that particular issue. Can I now turn, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the issue of ULES? Because uh, there are a number of myths about this, which I want to try and address, and there is also, more particularly, uh, a genuine discussion that needs to be had in this House. And my honourable friend spent about five minutes in his speech doing so, and I want to spend some time in response on that particular issue, which is this is the principle of having a clean air zone in the centre of a city is utterly without dispute, I think. And government has legislated for that, and local authorities and mayors agree with that. And for those of us who are right in the heart of the city right now here in Westminster, the original congestion zone makes total sense and is fully understandable. There is an argument. It's a hard argument to make, but there is an argument that there was an authority to extend um, the first extension out to the south and north circular and that that should be something that would be the wider congestion zone. But there is no manifesto. It is patently clear from reading, and I spent rather too long reading the manifesto of the present mayor, uh, some hour and a bit I will never get back in my life. There is no uh, argument whatsoever for the extension that has taken place. My honourable friend rightly talked about the consultation and the responses to that. And, and, and the best bit I can say is two points. The first is, Take the congestion zone that took place in Bristol, which has clearly been relatively successful, was done in, with due consideration, Mr Deputy Speaker, of businesses, of people living in the heart of the city, trying to keep a vibrant city going. That congestion zone is one mile by two. It's two square miles, basically. The congestion zone we are dealing with in London now has now gone up to approximately 600 square miles. It's 50 miles by 50 miles. The impact on the wider economy of London, apart from a moment the air quality, because I think he rightfully addressed that, the impact on the wider economy is obviously massive. Everybody who lives and works in London can see that, and that has had a tremendous impact on the businesses who we all want to support. The, the second bit would be there is a democratic deficit, is when it is put so far out to the outer limits of London with those who live beyond uh, the London boundary. That, those people who live beyond the London boundary are clearly penalised in a very significant way. And more particularly, the penalty falls upon two groups. And this, I take this from the own impact assessment as I set out uh, in the House and as, it, as others set out in the House last Friday. The penalty falls on two groups. It falls on low income, which is surely the worst group you should be trying to penalise with an extra tax. And it falls upon public sector workers, 
which again is the worst group. Anybody who knows anything about the public sector knows it is really hard to get NHS workers in central London. It is really hard to get care workers in central London. It is really hard to get police officers in central London. I could go on. The, of course I will. <laughs> I don't intend to take two hours, but he's absolutely right about the point of public sector workers. I mentioned in my speech about the fact that the Royal Marsden is having to refund ULES charges to cancer patients. But one other thing, surely, that we must consider here is that something like half of all the Metropolitan Police's officers live outside of the geographical area of Greater London. We have no wonder people don't feel like they can come and work in the city if they're having to pay £12.50 a day. So I hope that the Minister would agree that surely ULES is going to have an adverse effect on crime in London if the majority of our officers have to travel in and pay £12.50 a day to police our streets. Well, the Honourable Gentleman's got brilliant eyesight because he can see the highlighted passage I was about to make about <laughs> the uh, fact that 50% of police officers in the Metropolitan Police area live outside uh, the London boundary and commute in. And the percentage for emergency workers is probably not far off that. And uh, there is no doubt that's going to have a recruitment issue in all these particular sectors. Uh, and I, I go on further from that, because um, if, if I have a nurse or a care worker, self-evidently, for those of us, and I have spent three and a half weeks of my life in St Thomas's Hospital in requiring intensive care on not one but two occasions, because uh, I'm so accident prone. Um, the, because it's the case that you require, for example, overnight nursing care, a nurse who attends and comes from outside would get penalised on the day she goes in, and when she leaves for her night shift, she gets penalised again. So she gets a double whammy of a uh, ULES charge in circumstances which, and then we are surprised that London hospitals are struggling to retain staff in these particular circumstances. So we start with the ULES with, is there evidence actually that it is making a dramatic difference on air quality? And I think the evidence has been set out in a variety of ways um, that the, uh, the improvement is minimal in some respects, particularly the outer reaches is minimal. Is there an impact on the economy? Absolutely, there definitely is an impact on the economy. Uh, which is a negative impact. Is there an impact on public services, public sector workers, and those, and I quote from the impact assessment that low, impact, low income people will be more affected by ULES expansion, then without a shadow of a doubt, that is the case. And he raised, um, and I don't want to get too political on the last day before Easter because uh, this house is sitting, but he raised the issue of what's going to happen in the future. And the idea that the present mayor isn't going to expand uh, the impact of ULES is, 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 you know, for the birds. Of course he's going to. It is a bit like asking, are there moustaches in Mexico or do bears go to toilet in the woods? We both know that it is absolutely going to be the case that what the mayor is proposing to do is to extend the present proposal in a variety of ways. And I, I, I make the, the key point that... Uh, was made by my honourable friends for Sidcup, Crayford, Ashford, uh, Harlow from a sedentary position, and various other colleagues from Watford on Friday, that um, great thought needs to be done as to uh, the benefits of this public policy as against the massive burdens that are being driven forward. And, and you know, we have to clearly consider how it is that we are doing this on an ongoing basis. So, to wrap up, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe that my honourable friend remains a massive champion for this particular area. I'm delighted to come forward and see uh, the changes that he seeks. Of course it is the case that the Rail Minister will continue working with him. There is good work that is being done, uh, and quite obviously that we want to support him and his constituents on an ongoing basis. And on that basis, I commend him for bringing this debate to the House before Easter, and I commend uh, the uh, efforts that he is doing on behalf of his constituents.